Welcome back to another episode of Divorce Altitude. I'm Ryan Calamea. Now, it's summer when I'm recording this, and summer means legal conferences. In 2020, almost all legal conferences were being conducted virtually. I presented at the Family Law Institute, which is the legal conference for divorce lawyers in Colorado, along with Eric Six, who is a well-known business valuation expert, and we presented on rebuttal and shadow experts. This week, what we're going to do for the podcast is we're going to rebroadcast that presentation. It's pretty legalistic, but we thought it would be helpful for listeners to hear what essentially goes on at a legal conference, uh, and we hope that you find it's valuable. Upcoming, we're going to be also rebroadcasting an episode uh, or a presentation, rather, between um, by Amy and uh, Judge Arkin, um, and it's about parental responsibilities evaluations. Uh, and then after that, uh, we're going to be rebroadcasting this year, 2021, uh, in a pro- uh, p- presentation that I did with John Zervopoulos, who's appeared on this podcast before. We hope that these presentations, although fairly technical in nature, are nevertheless helpful for you in your journey on divorce at altitude. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy. Hi, I'm Ryan Kalamea. Uh, I am a family law lawyer based uh, in the mountains. Uh, I handle uh, most cases in Garfield County, Picking County, uh, and Eagle County, um, along with my partner, uh, Amy Gosha. Uh, and then we're here to talk about shadow uh, and rebuttal experts. Uh, and who's here uh, along with me? Eric Six, I am a certified public accountant and accredited in business valuation. Uh, my practice is devoted to providing expert services um, and consulting services in the context of marital dissolution. Now, when I say along here with me, um, I'm uh, currently at my uh, home office. Uh, Eric's at his uh, office down in uh, Louisville. So um, we're kind of going through this in a, in a different age, but uh, we've got a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, if there's any questions, uh, feel free to you know put those in the chat. Um, Eric and I plan on uh, being online and, and hopefully answering those. Um, we have our contact info at the end. Um, if you want to shoot us an email or call us um, anything that you want to discuss uh, regarding this presentation. So Here's uh, the kind of PowerPoint. So to start off with, uh, the question is, why do you care about shadow and rebuttal experts? And the simple answer is that it is going to help your client um, in uh, the right kind of case. And we wanna make sure that uh, for those who are considering uh, a shadow or rebuttal expert or any kind of expert work that you are you know, thinking critically about how you're going to use your expert in the case um, and what the kind of issues are. And we're gonna go through that. Um, so the kind of beginning is going to be about an overview of, of experts, the rules of disclosure, and the kind of various uh, uh, disclosure kind of nuanced issues. And then we're gonna flesh that out in, in a couple of examples at the end. And Eric and I are gonna discuss why various issues are going to come up. Um, and so, but there's obviously a, you know, a terminology that we need to make sure that we um, understand. Eric, how do you think or, or describe your work as, as a shadow? Well, it's interesting because when you use the term shadow expert, it, it sounds nefarious. It sounds like something you're trying to angle for your client and advocate your client in, in almost a borderline unethical way. And I don't see shadow experts as anything nefarious at all. Um, shadow experts are there to help you advocate for your client. They're to, uh, there to help you understand the issues that will arise during the process of, of engaging financial experts. Um, and they're gonna help your client feel like they have someone that listens to them, that, that they have a voice and the opportunity to um, express their concerns um, and understand what the joint expert is doing because many times we don't have an open line of communication between the joint expert and the client. So the shadow is there to help, help you advocate for your client and help you um, gain a good understanding uh, of the issues that you're going to deal with. Absolutely. So um, Eric, why don't you, there, there are kind of different models. You just referenced a joint expert for those 
Um, you know, the, and we'll get into Rule 16.2 and what the requirements are, uh, and and also some judges' perspectives um, and, and on how attorneys handle uh, the expert issue. So why don't you walk us through different expert models uh, that frequently come up in in family law cases? Sure. So the first step is we acknowledge the need for an expert. Obviously, there's an issue that we feel like we need an expert to testify to the court and give the court information to help the court make its determination on how to divvy up a marital estate or address a financial issue. Um, so there's different ways we can engage those experts. Um, there's the old school dueling expert model where everyone has their own solo expert. Um, and you know the battle of the experts and who's right and who can, can uh, put on a compelling presentation for the court. Um, there's the new school joint expert model that came about and was advocated for in 162 when, when we made those changes years ago. Um, and that's kind of what we're dealing with today is mainly focused on the engagement of a joint expert and then a shadow expert to help, uh, help you and help your client deal with the joint expert process. Um, and then we have the joint expert with shadow, which I, I just referenced to. Um, on the next slide, we have the joint expert with dueling experts. Sometimes you can get opposing counsel to agree to the engagement of a particular joint expert to address a certain scope of work. We want the joint expert to address the business valuation. Um, but sometimes you or opposing counsel don't want to engage a joint to address certain other issues. Um, and many times, for example, someone has a particular burden of proof that they need to meet separate property tracing, for example. You might have a case where there's a business valuation issue and a separate property tracing issue. Um, and you might not want to engage a joint expert uh, to trace the separate property. You might want the joint expert to do only the business valuation. And you might want to advocate a certain argument and engage your own solo expert to do the tracing. So there's some cases that are large enough that can justify two different engagement models. Um, cooperative experts, you know, I, this was five, 10 years ago, we'd occasionally have a cooperative expert model where um, I would work with one of my peers that I have a good relationship with that we would say, hey, uh, let's hot tub, address these issues, make sure we're getting the documentation that we both need to do the engagement. Um, we would come together, talk about the subjective issues that drive differences in valuations, and many times we would compromise on some of those subjective issues, narrow the disputes down to a minimum number of items that the court and the parties needed to address, and narrow the range of potential differences in the valuation conclusions. Um, this is a tough model, uh, especially for younger attorneys, because the cooperative expert model, you need to trust your, your expert, because your expert is going to compromise issues and many attorneys are uncomfortable with a cooperative expert model because they're giving up control to the expert. And it's not quite clear on the advocacy side whether you really want to give up that much control to a cooperative expert to allow them to make compromises on those advocate positions. But that's the cooperative expert model. Um, the last one is a blind cooperative expert model. Uh, we don't see this much at all. Um, you know, it's really tied more towards some of the provisions we see in the in buy-sell agreements where it says, hey, we're going to engage two experts. Um, or they're going to come to their own conclusions, and maybe we'll take an average of those two, or we'll hire yet a third expert to decide who's more right uh, and who's wrong, and then we'll pivot to that right position based on the third expert's perspective. Um, but, you know, it's an interesting model that sometimes can address um, the leaning of experts depending on who hires that particular expert because in a blind cooperative the expert doesn't know who's engaging them or are they presuming that um, there's two experts they're both engaged by both the parties and they're just coming up with their own independent opinion um, you know these models don't address some some other ways to engage experts uh, sometimes we have 706 court appointed experts um, Sometimes we have special masters, Rule 53 masters appointed that are accounting experts uh, or other types of experts that are given a little more power and control over the process um, that the court gives up some of the decision making to those special masters. So um, those are additional models that we have in addition to the joint expert.
engagement model. And we'll talk about rule seven to six later on, but as far as joint expert engagement, um, you know, you do have rule 16.2. Uh, it, it suggests that the parties will attempt to select uh, one expert um, per, per issue. Uh, and then we've got some kind of best practices about how you go about working. You know, uh, Dave Johnson just had a, a recent article in the Colorado Lawyer that I thought was, was really interesting. And here's some of the quotes from the judges on how uh, uh, litigants and, and attorneys are handling the joint expert issue. And, and the judges, the bench's perspective is, is largely consistent, at least with my own practice, in that um, you know property um, and it, it really kind of depends. Real estate, it's more common for a joint um, expert on on real estate to to uh, be agreeable for the parties as opposed to you know business valuations. And obviously, you've got uh, parental responsibilities evaluators and and child family investigators. Um, and so, it, and I think it varies uh, between the bench. I mean. You see A's to D's to F's. Um, I think number four was the one that really stuck out to me is that experienced lawyers get an A minus. Inexperienced counsel um, or those who, who don't have a common sense realistic outcome, um, I would give a D. And so this presentation is for, um, you know, the, the D. Uh, you know, don't, um, you know, a shadow expert is going to, um, you know, help you have a more realistic uh, outcome. And, um, and the experienced lawyers for a lot of this rebuttal and, and uh, shadow expert work, this is gonna be kind of uh, just at part of their daily practice, but really kind of leveling up your, um, your, your game as a, as a lawyer. Um, and, and when I say game, you know, not necessarily uh, gamesmanship, although it happens, but really kind of um, critically thinking about uh, the issues um, so that you can be that A, A minus. And there's gonna be, cases where a joint expert is going to be sufficient um, and you know there's going to be cases where you're going to need that shadow expert and so this um, presentation's helpful um, in looking at when is that appropriate and when is that not so in terms of a joint expert there are kind of various steps to go through uh, and you know we've got the factors to consider we'll, we'll address that what Eric referenced earlier is the scope of work, really defining what exactly is the joint expert uh, doing. Um, there's the engagement letter, there's uh, communication, and you know most uh, attorneys um, that I work with will have um, a, a letter that kind of spells out, and Eric will go kind of walk us through why, we, why we're gonna do that, but about communication and who's talking to who, uh, it really depends on the expert. It depends on the attorney. There may be a situation where, you know, the other attorney and I have worked together. Um, we have, you know, someone that we really trust as a joint, and we may not have that letter, but it, at least, you know, these are the kind of issues that you're going to um, address, and obviously making sure that, you know, a guy like uh, Eric is going to get paid. Um, so, Eric, uh, you know, here's the other thing is that this is more like a checklist of things that you want to talk with with the other attorney. Um, so when I, you know, call up the opposing counsel, I'm going to talk about timing of, of a report. Um, Eric, you know, from a joint expert, is there kind of some issues on 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 timing? There is. Uh, unfortunately, the number of we'll call them usual suspects that we have that are, are good at what we do um, is limited. Um, and, and many of our usual suspects are, are slowing down their practices. Some of us are just getting old. Um, so we have a, a, a new pool of potential joint experts, but many people don't have the relationships with those younger experts that they have with those older experts. And those older experts right now are spread thin. And when we talk about timing, when we talk about the commonly appointed joint experts, or the commonly agreed upon joint experts, um, they might be eight, 12 weeks out from when they get the documents to get you a draft report. And when you're looking at uh, the courts pushing on timing, the courts managing their docket, um, that might be a problem. So one of those pieces, when we talk about potential joint experts is, are they available and can they meet the time? 
Right, and, and I'm gonna talk with the opposing counsel about document production. Usually there's gonna be one party that has access to the documents. You know, there, there are gonna be those kind of jointly owned businesses um, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk about what, why that might matter, but, you know, and then how the process of the draft report and reviewing comments, and in particular, you know, we, we're not going to necessarily discuss shadow experts, but that's something that we might address as an attorney with our client um, after we get that draft report. So the, here are some uh, kind of general protocols for a joint expert. Um, Eric, do you want to walk us through this you know, pretty, pretty quickly? I do, and I'd, I'd like to just step back for one side to talk about the pros and cons and the appropriateness of, of engaging a joint expert versus doing the solo expert piece, if I could. Um, so one of the pieces that, that we wanted to make sure we talked about in, in our presentation is, you know, do we have a requirement? Or are there judges who feel like we have a requirement of engaging a single expert to address issues. And there is some inconsistency on our bench about how judges feel about joint experts, how judges feel about appointing their own expert, or how judges feel about appointing a special master. So when we talk about the pros and cons and you're thinking through, is a joint expert appropriate for this particular case? Don't forget, is a joint expert appropriate for this particular judge? Because um, a lot of judges won't even have the discussion of solo experts unless you are um, appealing to them to make an exemption for a, a joint expert engagement. Um, and, and there are certain judges in Arapaho and Boulder where you have to ask permission before engaging a rebuttal expert. Um, and I've heard judges say things like, you can hire whoever you want but it doesn't, need, doesn't necessarily mean I'm gonna to listen to that person. Because unless the joint expert has made just a significant error, I'm leaning that direction. And that comes back to one of our slides earlier on 16.2 of um, you know, whether a joint expert has presumptive weight. And I, I love the quote in the Rule of Civil Procedure, the court shall not give presumptive weight to the rebuttal report of a court appointed expert or jointly selected expert when such report is disputed by one or both parties. I mean, I, this is one of those questions I'd love to have everybody raise their hand of, do you think a joint expert doesn't have presumptive weight? If you don't think a joint expert has presumptive weight, you're deluding yourself. That joint expert has incredible power. So when we come back to that joint expert engagement, and the process and whether we want to join expert, you need to understand that that joint expert is going to get presumptive weight. I don't care what the statute says. Um, I don't care what the rules say. That joint expert is going to have presumptive weight and you are empowering a some, somebody who's not advocating for your client to come up with an opinion that you're going to have to work hard to get the court to move off of. So just one of those pieces that um, when we talk about the appropriateness of joint expert that you're thinking through. Sure. Well, do you want to um, go through the, the kind of model protocols here? Sir, sure. so we have these model protocols for a reason. Um, the joint expert, it's a tough role. It is a thankless task. If you do your job well, nobody likes you. <laughs> if you do your job well, it's like a good mediated settlement where you know you got a good settlement if both feels both parties feel like they got short shafted on the way out the door because you're probably in that reasonable range of a reasonable conclusion because nobody feels good about the result. If a joint expert does their job well, one says, you're, you're high, it can't be that low. And the other says, you're high, it can't be that high. So chances are you probably got in the right range, but it's not the best business model to be a joint expert because if you do your job well, You've upset everybody, but you know, we have these protocols here for a reason because the joint expert is a tough role and we want to make sure there's no implied or perceived bias in the process because um, you don't want to have to explain to your client why the joint expert was having ex party communications with opposing counsel and that those discussions didn't impact their conclusion. Um, you want a process that makes sense and that you can 
uh, explain to your client on why this joint expert has done something as far as the process is concerned, that's fair. So we have protocols on communication. We don't want ex parte communications. I don't want to have ex parte communications. I don't want to have conversations with one attorney on a case, excluding the other attorney, while once trying to spin their case for me. I don't like those discussions. I don't want to have those discussions during the process. So these protocols are not only so you and your client can ensure a fair process, but they're to help the joint expert come to their own independent conclusion of value. So we have protocols on um, communications. Uh, Ryan mentioned the scope of work is critically important. Once you set that scope of work, it's gonna be locked down. And if you decide uh, a month later that you want me to expand my scope of work to include a marital balance sheet or an income analysis, and it wasn't addressed in that initial scope of work, I'm gonna need to have opposing counsel agree to expand my scope of work. And chances are, if you want it, they won't. And then you're in a position of having to engage yet another expert to address those issues, as opposed to making sure you think through the scope of work from the get-go. Um, so each one of these bullet points in our model protocols are there, and I think they are, are good protocols that help facilitate the process and help ensure fairness, um, and at, at least from a perception perspective, that uh, the process has, has moved forward fairly. And Eric, as a, as a shadow expert, when you, if let's say that you're engaged very early on, and are you consulting with the attorney about which joint expert may be a, a bet, the best fit for your case, as well as explaining the process, this process to the actual client? Absolutely, and I think this is a, a critical role for a shadow to play is just getting people comfortable that this is the process we need to take. This is the type of information that we're gonna to need to share. Um, you know, from, from my perspective, a good shadow engagement, no one ever knows I'm there. The only thing I'm doing is helping you and your client understand the process. I'm advocating for, for information to be produced to the joint expert. I'm reviewing the joint experts draft report and making sure they're considering all the relevant factors. And if they've made an oversight or a mistake, we pointed out that they're moving their position in a final report consistent with what I think is the right answer. And I never come out of the woodworks. I don't need to do a rebuttal report because I've done my job through the process. I've influenced the final draft report to um, get the joint expert in the right range of potential conclusions. And you know, there is a range. And it doesn't mean they need to be exactly where my, my answer is, but if they're in a reasonable range and they've got there during the process and I don't feel the cost benefit is there to rebut, that's a good engagement for me. And, and this, you know, we, you referenced this earlier in 706 in terms of the court may appoint an expert, at least, you know, according to the, uh, David Johnson's kind of informal survey of judges, it's rarely used. I mean, the, it was, I think a couple of judges were like, I've done it once. Um, it, it is there, uh, and you know, the, in Rule 706, and it gets to Eric's point, is that some judges, uh, you know, they they do, you know, think that you have to have a joint expert and only a joint expert. Um, you know, they, at least in Rule 706, and we'll get into you know 16.2, is that nothing in the in in these rules prevent you from you know hiring your own. So let's say that you get into um, uh, you know a joint expert. Uh, you know, situation or even a, just a rebuttal uh, expert, a do, kind of battle of the experts. What are the rules required for disclosure and how do you handle that? Um, you know, Eric already touched on this in terms of the, uh, you know, the joint experts report coming into evidence um, and, you know, the presumptive way, even though uh, it's not, you know, it's, it's prohibited, uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, human nature uh, kind of follows that a joint expert. It's kind of like the uh, judge in a parenting case who, you know, says, I'm going to really look at the neutral collaterals, like the counselors, the teachers, and I find those to be the most persuasive. You know, the joint expert is the neutral party. Um, and so, but that doesn't mean that the, the joint expert is infallible or that, you know, you just do a joint expert in every single case. Um, and so, you know, I just wanted to uh, kind of put out there 
uh, you know, Rule 16.2, you know, sometimes there can be con some confusion or, or, or not necessarily confusion, but games, gamesmanship in terms of filing a report, an expert report. Uh, you know, it's supposed to CFI and PRE, those are obviously different kinds of, of uh, you know, experts and their court appointed uh, experts. Um, you know, the, I, I should mention, I mean, this, this focus and Eric is obviously a business valuation expert, but these rules of disclosure are something to keep in mind in terms of consulting experts on parenting or some other, you know, issue that you may have, uh, you know, you may have in your case. Um, you know, here's a fairly kind of meaty slide. Uh, and, but the, the reason is that, you know, the, it, there's an interesting kind of dynamic going on in that rule 16.2 requires you to disclose your expert and lay witnesses 63 days in advance. But, and that comes before the expert reports themselves are actually uh, due, whether it be a joint expert or kind of the battle, the, the retained uh, experts. Um, Eric, I've never had a judge strike, you know, a rebuttal uh, expert that we, you know, disclosed 35 days uh, in advance um, of, of trial, uh, even though they weren't disclosed. Have you ever, have you ever heard of that? I, I have not. And at least the attorneys that I regularly work with, they don't feel the duty to disclose or a rebuttal expert. I mean, there's always the language of, any engaged expert for purposes of rebuttal. Um, I've seen those general, but not specific to, I am going to rebut this analysis because who knows if you're going to or not. And I've never seen any case, you know, we've got the Hatton case uh, where, in, and that was a parenting case, uh, you know, and the, the party endorsed, you know, our retained expert in the JTMC. I mean, it was, and, and, and it was, you know, an older case uh, the, the court allowed, but that was the only case really that I'm aware of. Uh, but the, the issue is that you just need to be intimately familiar with the disclosure obligations and keep those in mind when you're working through rebuttal. Um, you know, this, uh, the, the rule 16.2 requires that the joint expert is provided information for uh, a rebuttal that, that a rebuttal expert, the same information. Um, Eric, how do you, you know, is that, why don't you tell me your thoughts about kind of being a shadow expert and the kind of information that you may receive um, compared to a joint? You know, I, I, this is a sensitive one and it's an area that, that is um, a potential area for people to play games. I, I don't do that. I don't um, take information that's relevant to a joint expert and not share with them. Um, you know, as, as much as anything, I think my role as a shadow and um, many times I've testified on behalf of the joint to a special discovery master saying this is why the joint needs that information. So if anything, I feel like I'm advocating for the joint so they can have the information to do their job. Um, so, you know, the potential for gamesmanship on people having documents that the joint doesn't have. I don't, I don't like that. I don't do that. And, and, and I don't think you should do that. If that's something you're tempted to do in your practice, just don't. No. And, and, you know, there, there is an issue and I think the attorneys don't necessarily think about it. And it, you know, there are certainly some attorneys that are going to really push the envelope and, and, you know, the, uh, where they'll give information or they'll withhold information from the, you know, from the joint that, you know, arguably should. And, this presentation is not getting into the ethical or disclosure issues. Um, it's just highlighting that, you know, if, if you transition from a shadow expert and you provide information to a shadow expert, that is something to think about in consideration with uh, a, a, when that shadow expert transitions to a rebuttal expert, that then instead of a consulting expert, they then become a testifying expert. And there are obligations for a rebuttal expert that they have to provide the information that they're relying on. And so it is something that attorneys, I think, may just think, oh, I can just, you know, share my deepest and darkest secrets with, you know, a shadow expert and I don't have to tell anyone. Well, you know, notwithstanding the rule of 16.2 of, of full and transparent disclosure, 
um, you know, that, you know, there may be some considerations um, in settlement when you're kind of working with the shadow. So I just mentioned that so that people think about it. Um, you know, the uh, issue is, um, you know, do you have to disclose a shadow uh, expert? And under Rule 26, you have to disclose uh, an expert that is going to be testifying. And so there is going to be, uh, you know, some discussions, there's gonna be information. You know, Eric, if you're preparing uh, a worksheet or a schedule um, in anticipation of mediation, if you ever had a request that you have to provide that, um, you know, to the other side? I have had the request, but I have never provided CRE 408 stuff. So my my practice, I do a lot of mediations. I do a lot of preliminary analyses so we can settle cases um, when I'm acting in that shadow role and I'm not rebutting. Um, so all of that stuff in my mind is, is non-discoverable. Um, and additionally, when there are those situations where I'm doing the shadow, I'm doing mediation, I'm doing a wide scope of work, but they need me to rebut on a particular issue. Um, when it comes to discovery, I'll give them all the documents relevant to that issue, but the rest of the stuff, it no, that's that's non-discoverable information as far as, as as my understanding is concerned. Yeah, and 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 that's borne out at least or supported. That view is supported um, by at least my reading uh, in the case law of the you know Rule sixteen point two uh, twenty six. Um, you know, it does bring up an issue of of disclosure. Um, you know, in in terms of you know these the the kind of cases that we're addressing this is uh, you know a, a subject matter for a completely different uh presentation but it is something to you know to to you know mention um you know in remarriage of of Dury, uh you know there was a joint expert and you know ha if a case comes up you know later because of disclosure and whether or not a party knew what they were doing you know having that shadow expert um, it at that point may come out or or may be relevant. Certainly, you know, a malpractice uh, scenario for an attorney um, having that shadow, um, you know, and I don't want to go so far as to say that in any joint expert uh, uh, engagement or any kind of uh, case, you always have to have a shadow expert. But, you know, Eric, have you ever caught a, an error in, in a joint expert's report? <laughs> I, I wish I could say it wasn't as common as it as it is. And I am far from perfect as well, but um, this is bespoke work and we're doing things from scratch and Excel workbooks and people make mistakes. And um, I think that's the, the lowest hanging fruit, the easiest reason for you to engage a shadow or a potential rebuttal expert is to catch those basic issues that if you didn't have somebody take a peek at that stuff, you might have some problems. Okay, so let's talk about business valuation specifically. Um, so Eric, you know, can you give us just a brief overview of business valuations, the, the approaches, uh, and then maybe some examples of methods. And then what we're gonna do is kind of apply this to a couple scenarios to really show how a shadow and rebuttal expert are going to you know, help uh, or give some input. Yeah, so um, from a 30,000 foot perspective, when you're having your shadow review a joint expert engagement um, and a report, you know, they're gonna be focused on particular issues and subject, subjective areas of judgment that are made by the joint expert that um, they can move. And when we talk about potential ranges of value of uh, a conclusion, you know, it can get pretty wide with rather small subjective changes in assumptions made by the joint expert. So for purposes of preparation for, for mediation or for preparation for trial, you know, these are areas that a slight tweak can help you advocate for your client's position if you don't have a, a rebuttal expert and you're wanting to move that, that, that number slightly in your particular client's direction. So when we talk about um, approaches, methodologies, you know, we can compare this to, um, uh, a residential property appraisal. We, we have market, we have asset, we have income approaches. And when we think about the market approach, what we're saying is, well, your neighbor's house that is just like yours sold for $300,000. So chances are your house is probably around $300,000. Um, that's a market approach. 
when we talk about an asset approach, we're talking about, well, what's the cost to replace? If it costs $300,000 to build your house, that's an example of a cost to replace an asset approach. And then when we think about an income approach, the analogy would be, well, I can rent my house for, for $3,000 per month. And if we take a present value of those cash flows, maybe the present value is $300,000 as well. So when we talk about business valuations, what you're going to typically see with the most common practice that you're going to have to address um, is going to be an excess earnings approach. And the excess earnings approach is developed through a, a series of cases um, and IRS rulings um, in specific marriage of Huff, uh, a law practice valuation. So it's a nice, easy approach. It's going to be the approach you're gonna see a joint expert apply to a professional practice, whether it's an accounting practice, whether it's a medical practice, um, any kind of professional consulting piece, you're probably gonna see an excess earnings. And for many other types of business, you're gonna kind of see an excess earnings approach. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through a basic model of an excess earnings approach and talk about where the areas of dispute and subjective movement can come and um, what the impact of those movements are. So Eric, you know, if it, it would be an example, if a joint expert applied, you know, an asset, uh, you know, approach to, uh, you know, a, a professional practice as the shadow, what, what are you, what's your kind of reaction to that in the discussion like with, you know, with the client? So I, I think that's a good example. And I think I'd get even more specific. Let's say the joint expert applied an asset approach, calling it a buy sell. So an asset approach being either, here's what I get when I walk out the door, being my share of accounts receivable for a law practice. And let's say that's controlled by a buy sell agreement and says, well, if you walk out, you're not getting good well, you're getting your share of accounts receivable less these costs. And that's all you get when you walk out of the door of the law practice. So when we see that, and fortunately we don't see it very often, uh, we would sit down with our client, we'd sit down with counsel, we'd talk about our case law that addresses that type of methodology, we'd talk about the potential areas for um, a rebuttal, um, and you know, it, it, that's an example where you probably picked the wrong joint expert. <laughs> uh, <laughs> fair who enough. Who um, isn't familiar with our case law, isn't familiar with with personal practice goodwill in the context of marital dissolution in Colorado, and and is maybe more um, you know a fair market value estate and gift type expert who doesn't see these goodwill arguments consistent with marriage of Hoth. But that would be the nature of the discussion we would have if we saw something like that across our table. Right, and and you know this 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 slide you know, is more for the, the attorneys. And when you are sitting down at, you know, to consider your case um, and whether or not a shadow or a buttle or a joint expert, um, you know, obviously you're thinking about the amount that is involved. It doesn't make sense to have, you know, a joint valuation expert and a shadow expert if we're talking about like a $10,000, you know, uh, business. Um, you, you also need to look at like who who's going to end up maybe with you know the the value or the business that you are or the property that you're valuing. Um, the other thing that I think is 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 worth mentioning is that as a shadow expert, um, you know Eric Eric's going to be if he's the shadow expert, he's going to be looking at other issues such as child support, maintenance, uh, you know uh, division of property and he can do that you know, in, in, in a more kind of holistic uh, approach compared to a rebuttal expert who's going to be limited to that particular issue of which their report addresses. And so you can kind of get into, um, you know, that, but who the attorney is, um, is certainly a factor. You know, there's going to be some, uh, you know, attorney relationships where, you know, you just know that it's likely that, you know, a, it's going to be a joint expert and then two, you know, two other experts. And so certainly there's uh, an argument to be made, hey, let's just remove the joint expert because I know that the other side's just gonna hire their own expert. And, and instead of having three experts, let's just agree to, you know, to have two, but that's at least the discussion that you're, you're having with your client, that you're 
considering with opposing counsel. Um, but you know, really kind of where the rubber hits the road is a business valuation. So Eric, if you're the, the you know, the shadow expert, um, you know, this, uh, tell us what we're looking at and, and you know, the, the considerations that you as a financial expert are, are working through and, and the decisions that are being made, what is, what's an art and what's a science when we're looking at, at, at something like this? That's a good way to put it too. So what we're looking at is a typical asset excess earnings analysis, and you're going to see this out of your joint expert. And what we've modeled in that top part of the table is a nice middle of the road, um, reasonable assumptions that you're going to see out of a joint expert that um, I would be happy to see out of my joint expert. Um, the danger is that if we tweak some of these adjustments just slightly, the potential range of results can go from that bottom right corner where uh, just slight changes, you've got a range of 473,000 at the low end to 1.6 million at the high end. So someone, you could hire a joint expert and they could just make some slight changes and some slight different subjective judgments. And that number can vary from that middle of the Roy joint expert presentation significantly. Um, and, and that's one of the pieces that when we talk about joint experts, I want a joint expert who's predictable. I want to be able to go to my client and say, you know what, we're gonna select this joint expert because I've seen 10 of the same reports on the same type of entity and it's gonna be right middle of the road. What I don't want is an unpredictable joint expert, an unproven joint expert, because um, if they come up with something that is just in the left field, I got to work really hard to get it back to a realistic conclusion. So, you know, that top part is a nice middle of the road. But what we're trying to point out here is you change um, the adjusted net income and the income attributable to practice and the, the weighting of the average. So many times what we do as valuation experts is we use history as a proxy for the future. And we'll look for a period of time, three, four, five years, on a stable business and say, well, this is what the business has done historically. Let's use that as a proxy for what it's going to do in the future. And we have an option of doing, well, let's use a straight average being one weight for each one of those prior three years. Let's use a weighted average that gives more weight to the most recent performance, which makes sense if you have a business that's increasing or decreasing in terms of top line revenue and bottom line profitability. But those slight differences on straight versus a weighted average can make a significant difference on that conclusion. Other areas where you've got suggestive judgment that can have a large impact is the multiplier, the capitalization rate, how we come up with the value of that goodwill intangible asset component. You can take it from 225 to 375. That's a reasonable range for those multiples. But you know, if we look at Huff, they talk about a one and a five. Rarely would I say a one or a five is applicable or should be something that you should see out of a joint expert unless someone's coming to the end of their career or you're expecting things to just skyrocket in terms of future income um, to justify a five times multiplier. So when we talk about reasonable ranges, I'm talking about 225, 375, somewhere right around that three times multiplier, depending on the interest rate environment, depending on the taxes, depending on the issues that you're dealing with, the risks. Um, but if you hire a joint expert and they come back and they say, it's, it's a one or a five, again, you, you're, you've engaged somebody that you can't predict where they're gonna be. I want a joint expert to be middle of the road assumptions. Um, and I won't use that joint expert again if they give me something that I can't predict. So again, the point of this is just to show we want middle of the road assumptions from our joints. We don't want unpredictable joints coming up with uh, wide disparities in value, even though that's easy to do with some different subjective judgments. And Eric, I think, you know, at least when uh, kind of early on in my practice, it was intimidating when you got these really technical spreadsheets and it was really hard to kind of figure out what was going on. So let me just make sure I kind of understand and just for those that may not. So this 500,000 you've got, this is the amount of adjusted net income. And 
this is, you know, there, there's adjustments that are being made by evaluation experts to add back in various expenses that may have been taken for personal expenses or that were one-off transactions. And so would you agree that it's that's a subjective decision by the joint expert or any expert on what is a, a, a fair adjustment and what is not? And that's an excellent point, Ryan, because when we talk about the joint expert and what they're gonna do in the valuation process and what they're not going to do. As a joint expert, you put me in the position of the joint expert, I'm gonna rely on representations from the business owner. I am not gonna audit the, the financial statements. I'm not gonna audit what portion of meals and entertainment are personal versus business. I'm gonna ask the question, but I'm gonna rely on that representation when it comes back to me. If non-property spouse says they're lying, and they have $100,000 of meals and entertainment expense that really is our trip to Cabo every month for the last year, um, they're gonna have to give that information to the joint expert and ask the joint expert to make a hypothetical calculation. Um, and that's one of the weaknesses in the joint expert is the joint expert's gonna rely on the information they're provided. They are not going to do an audit and if you, have a joint expert and they're stuck in that position, one of the good reasons to have a shadow is so your shadow can help you provide the information to the joint expert so they can they can advocate your position on adjustments, personal expenses. Okay, so if you're a, if you're a shadow expert, and we'll get into this in some of the examples, but if you, I mean, if you're a shadow expert rather, and the client says, listen, they, they are really cooking the books or they're really, I know that my, you know, if, you, if you're a shadow expert for the wife and the husband is really pushing the envelope, then you as the shadow are going to say, you know, I can change this number a little bit within, you know, the, based on what your, your client um, can tell you and you could see what difference that would make, right? Correct. Not only can we model it with those different assumptions, but we can say we can work with our client, non-property spouse to say, Give me the credit cards, let's go through this information. You can identify what's personal because you were on the trip and we can present to the joint and say, hey joint, we understand what property spouse has told you, but here is some alternative information and we would want you to do a hypothetical calculations assuming that these expenses are really personal. Okay, and then reasonable compensation. Um, you know, how are our experts valuation experts, how are they arriving at reasonable compensation? What does that do for the value of the business? And is it, you know, the end all be all for whatever the joint expert says for reasonable compensation? Can you explain, you know, the, the kind of um, subjective nature of reasonable compensation? Sure, so when we talk about this adjustment and reasonable compensation conceptually, what we're saying is we need to break the cash flow from the business between what is really just the, the 40 hour a week job effort of the um, working spouse, the property spouse who actually owns the business and works the business, and what's really the cash flow attributed to the goodwill. So when we talk about reasonable compensation, um, I like to, to say, well, how much would you have to pay somebody to do what you're doing so you could sit on the beach and collect what's left over? And when you say, is it the end all be all that the joint expert is using this, these particular statistics to come up with reasonable compensation, it is not the end all. And this is an area where there is a lot of subjectivity on which statistic we use. Do we use median? Do we use the 75th percentile? Do we use the 90th percentile? And when I talk about medians versus percentiles, we have statistics that have a thousand responses. And between those thousand responses, there's a median, the exact middle response, and there's the 75th percentile kind of response and the 90th percentile. And each one of those, depending on your professional, might be an appropriate statistic for what you would have to pay somebody to do what you're doing now so you could sit on the beach. But some joint experts lean towards median, some lean towards an average of median and 75th. I saw a joint expert recently, went to the 90. And um, so depending on your joint expert, they might have exact um, and justifiable good reasons to get to wherever they're gonna get. 
But that is an area that is a, a, a subjective and subject to se second guessing. Well, and, and, you know, so an example would be if you were valuing a law practice, you know, lawyers, you know, we have huge egos, everyone thinks that they're exceptional, um, you know, but the bottom line is that, you know, we're, uh, you know, mostly average. I mean, that's what the definition is. So what would the impact if, if you, if an expert was using, you know, the median and really what the attorney uh, was is a superstar, you know, 90th percentile, and that pushes the reasonable compensation up. What does that do to the value of the business? It can take it down dramatically. So the higher the reasonable compensation, the more it's attributable to just the job and not the goodwill. So the less that's attributable in the cash flow to the goodwill, the less the goodwill value, the less the value of the business. So I mean, there, there are experts out there who might believe that the reasonable compensation for this particular example is $750,000 in 2019, and that there's absolutely no goodwill because you would have to pay somebody exactly what that professional is making to do what they're doing. Um, okay, so then, so, you know, you, you will kind of say, listen, I think this reasonable compensation, this is actually really good for you. You know, the joint expert, um, client, you know, that this, this, and, and explain to the client. I mean, frequently, um, Eric will explain to, you know, uh, a, a client, um, you know, the, the impact of reasonable compensation. Let's talk about waiting very, you know, briefly. So um, it, you mentioned, you know, an increase. So the value is, or the revenue is going up, you know, year over year. So that's why, presum you know, presumably there's a waiting. And so the 2019 year, the most recent year is being, you know, there's a bigger emphasis placed on that. And so how is that going to matter to the business, um, you know, the enterprise value compared to just a straight average? And when would a straight average be, you know, more appropriate? Sure. So when we talk about trends in, in business performance, trends in income for a professional, um, you know, depending on where you are in your career, you might be on an upward trend. If you're early on in your career, you're taking more responsibilities and, and you're kind of hitting the Phoenix for your income. Uh, alternatively, you might be on a downward trend. You might be an older attorney or older professional that's coming down um, in their career. Your referral sources are getting old, you're getting old, and there might be good reasons to do the exact opposite. So when we talk about this particular example, we've got an increase in income through 2019. And let's talk about what that means relative to 2019. 2019 is a great year for this guy. Um, but as with any business, there is a cycle. There's a business cycle. So we, we want to use averages to take into account that every year is not gonna be 2019. Or in this case, I don't believe every year is gonna be 2019. But by using that average, if you look at the income attributable to the practice, it's, two, it's 376,000 in 2019. But by using an average of those prior years when the numbers are lower, I'm coming up with a weighted average of 253,000. That's significantly less than what that person made in 2019, the recent full year. So depending on your facts and circumstances, that might not feel good <laughs> to a client to say, well, wait, he just made, or she just made 376,000 in excess, in, in, in income attributable to the practice, he made 750 grand, and you're assuming that he's not gonna make that every year in the future. There's good reasons for that, but those averages try to take into account um, just the volatility of the business cycle. Right, now obviously we're living through, um, you know, a global pandemic right now, and the impact of, you know, what that's gonna have on a restaurant compared to, you know, a, a family law, you know, practice, um, you know, there's going to be a huge variation. Um, but, you know, so you've got, you mentioned the multiplier. Uh, so there can be a dispute between, you know, experts on whether you use a one, uh, this expert or the joint experts using a three. And is it fair? So you're using different multiples down here. Um, and it's resulting in a huge variance between uh, the business value. And so at least from, you know, as a shadow expert, you're consulting with the attorney and the client about, hey, you know, this multiplier, 
this this might not be the right multiplier and and you know this next slide is we kind of get into our our you know beginning of the uh you know the hypotheticals so eric when you um are the the shadow expert and you know the client is is the wife and the husband's making you know a separate property claim you know can you walk us through um how that is going to impact the the shadow experts work well this example is near and dear to my heart of course um, so when we talk about uh, uh, the burden to prove a separate property claim, and if I'm acting as a shadow, it, it's usually um, my role and one of the things I want to be doing as the shadow before issuing any report, before doing anything, is making sure the information is there for me to do my job if husband's expert doesn't cr do it correctly. So I want to request those monthly bank statements. I want to request those monthly brokerage account statements from the date that um, the property was inherited or gifted or the date of marriage until now. Um, and the, one of the reasons I want to do that is I want to help them understand that they can't prove their separate property claim if they don't have that information. Um, and I want to also be ready to rebut if husband comes up with uh, an analysis that I don't think is consistent with Burford, for example, and they're doing some kind of alternative argument. But one of the nice things about that role is, you know, while I'm doing some work on the front end, I'm really waiting for husband to figure out whether he can prove that separate property claim or not. And I'm waiting for that analysis to get completed. And if there's good cooperation on the case, I'm going to get that solo experts excel model when they're done so i can make different assumptions and come up with different conclusions from wife's perspective if they're able to prove up that separate property claim so this one is a this is the fun engagement for me because at the front end i'm looking at their sworn financial i'm looking at them engaging an expert and i'm thinking gosh, it's a 20 year marriage. I wonder how much success they're gonna have pulling up a, a monthly bank statement from 20 years ago, knowing that it's gonna be really difficult. So, um, and even if they do, because of the way we do our tracings, it, it's gonna be one of those situations where at some point they're gonna figure out that they can't prove up all their separate property. Um, and if they decide then to make an aggressive argument, you know, it's, it's easier for us to do that in rebuttal and say, yeah, I understand that you want to ignore the fact you need to trace it, but this is what you needed to do, and this is why you can't make your separate property claim. Yeah, and I'll note that um, it's probably really fun for you when you're on the other side uh, from me on, on a situation <laughs> in scenario one. Uh, so scenario two, so, you know, we, we have that joint valuation. Um, we, we going back to the kind of uh, the, the spreadsheet that we went two slides ago, um, and so, here, what is the kind of work that you're doing uh, in consulting on, you know, reasonable compensation? Hey, that that's a good number for you, client. Um, but you know, let's let's push the envelope, or let's work through the joint and ask the joint before, like when we get that draft report, to go to the joint expert and say, hey, could you, would you, you know, we we think that uh, a multiplier of 2.75 is more appropriate. Um, can you kind of walk us through that? Sure. So many times uh, this will be a uh, someone picks up the phone and says, hey, we just got a joint expert report. We're going to mediation in a week. Um, can you help arm us for mediation um, and review the report and see where, where there are areas that we could argue against or influence the conclusion? And is the joint expert report something that is acceptable or not? So that's the typical structure for something like this when I get called. It's first I'm going through a joint expert report with a tight deadline. I'm looking for those mathematical errors. I'm looking for the subjective judgments being made and getting an understanding for the arguments that uh, attorney and client want to make with regard to those subjective judgments. And then sometimes, many times, um, preparing an analysis that they can take into mediation. Sometimes I go with them to mediation to say, hey, mediator, this is the joint expert report. These are our concerns. Here's our alternative presentation. And here is, is our marital balance sheet with our presentation and our number to start that, that discussion, that mediated position. 
And I, we're getting short on time, so let's kind of blitz through shadow number or scenario three. And this is where, uh, you know, you might be the shadow expert and, and you know, that might have a rebuttal uh, expert that you hire in the same issue. Why, why would you do that? And, and what is the importance of having, you know, a startup software company, you know, in your mind, is, is a startup company a little bit more, would militate more in favor of getting just, you know, an expert on each side because the uncertainties that um, would result in, in the valuation that a joint expert might not be the best option in that scenario? Correct. So, you know, when we talk about startup companies, startup software companies, companies that have projections of hockey stick growth in the future and expectations that those projections are real, you know, it's tough for a joint expert to use history as a proxy for the future. So they are more uncomfortable and they're not going to stick their neck out on using projections for valuations. So if you have a client who really believes or really doesn't believe in these projections for a startup um, and future success, you want to probably engage your own expert to show those projections, show the value of, of the software company um, based on those projections. And a joint's gonna be less likely to um, rely on those future projections in their analysis. So many times I've been engaged and, and usually, um, as one would expect, people are calling me when there's significant marital estates um, so many times we can justify and it makes sense for not only for me to act as a shadow and um, frankly, a consulting expert in the courtroom with counsel, but to have somebody else actually do either the case in chief or the rebuttal to a joint expert report if we're trying to advocate for a position. So if there's enough dollars involved, you want to have somebody who understands the nature of that process, those valuations and the questions and answers that you're gonna get out of an expert in cross. So you can respond quickly in that trial, in that hearing to the responses that you're getting from that, that expert. And it makes it a lot easier for you to have your own expert sitting there with you to say, okay, that's the answer I got from the expert in cross. What does that mean? What is the appropriate follow-up is there an opportunity for, for impeachment or for making the case in our presentation on our theory? Um, and many times I'll sit in the courtroom and, and help with that. Right. And, and you know, if you have any questions, uh, again, feel free. You know, if, if you are looking for a, a model kind of template letter for a joint expert, you know, happy to provide at least my draft template. Um, so email us. Um, and, you know, uh, feel free to, to uh, ask any questions, but uh, thanks so much for uh, your time. Sorry, we ran a little bit over time. Thanks.